and blessed beyond our imagining. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Now hear the words of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and following. Now to God, who by the power at work within us is abundantly is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all that we can ask or imagine. To this God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'm tempted to talk about money today, but often when a pastor speaks about money, people's eyes glaze over, their attention goes elsewhere, anywhere, but to the topic at hand. So I'm not going to talk about money. I am going to try to be faithful to Mark's gospel reading that speaks to wealth and riches. You and the God who sustains you are going to have to do some translating as to how your experiences of wealth and riches intersect with your bank account. So where to begin? Well, how about with a few quotes? Christian stewardship is more than the management of things. It's the refusal to let things manage us. James Lawless. And then a slide up here that will tell me more. In receiving, we learn how to give. Those who give well are those who have learned to receive well. Brad Reiners. And finally, stewardship does not begin with giving, but with receiving. It does not begin with an action, but with an attitude. Everything that I have has been given to me. We have heard a gospel reading where the young man with wealth and riches is confronted by Jesus. Point blank, the young man requires an attitude adjustment. If only such attitude adjustments could be made, say, as efficiently as a chiropractor can manipulate your back with a spinal adjustment. But attitude adjustments, they're not made at the level of muscles and spinal vertebrae. No, attitude adjustments that Jesus addresses are experienced at the level of our soul, the very core of our daily experience. Daily experience can be a tug of war where fear and anxiety, angst tell us that God can't be trusted to provide for us. But there's also that other side of the tug of war where we turn in faith and confidence and trust to a God who in all circumstances is the provider, the sustainer of it all. And it takes attitude, a fortitude, a courage to trust in God's provision when the world is screaming otherwise. Stock market, did you want to look at it this past week or maybe four weeks ago? <laughs> all right. Christians across the globe have just experienced Ash Wednesday worship. I want to thank Celebration for introducing me to the importance of the imposition of ashes upon the life of the God's people here in this place. It's quite a statement, actually. Well, my email this week included a devotional from the college I attended back in the 1970s. The campus ministry at St. Olaf is sending out a devotional online each Wednesday of Lent. And I found last Wednesday's devotional pretty insightful. It said this, Perhaps you feel at times that you are two people, that you are split, that you are divided. There's the outward self, the one that's confident and capable, the one who's smiling and sure. And then there's the inward self, the one that's fragile and afraid, the one that's insecure and unsure. We're good at switching between the two or perhaps more correctly, we're good at living both simultaneously, ensuring the world sees one while we fight desperately against the other. But on Ash Wednesday, we get to acknowledge that there's an inner world. On Ash Wednesday, through the words of confession and psalms and songs and prayers, we get to lift up our whole selves to God and hear the good news that God loves our whole selves. It's not just the public self, but the inner private self that is wrapped in grace. 
wrapped in grace. That is such a comforting thought. It's been many years now since I served the congregation, but I have a memory. My memory is of one of the congregation's older quilters as her health was failing. Her only daughter was also a member of the congregation, and I would often meet that daughter at the hospital where she was a worker on one of the the floors as a nurse. Well, during her mother's last days, the nurse cared for her mom in the mom's humble home, and I can still remember accompanying the daughter into her mother's bedroom. We prayed for her, we read from the Psalms, and while we did so, mom lay comfortably comfortably beneath a beautiful quilt that she and the other quilters had sewn together. It was a gift, remarkable in its colors, remarkable in its, in its fullness, its delight, but it was truly a gift that she wanted close at hand, and so she put it on her bed and lay beneath it. She received it as both a gift and as a sign that in this world, She and her family had always been wrapped in grace. And that, my brothers and sisters, is true for each of us. Our lives are wrapped in grace. Recently, I stumbled upon an article while reading the BBC's daily online webpage, and the article was about acceptance and commitment therapy. Wouldn't you know, I can't find the article now. But the nugget that I uncovered there was this. Those who discover a gift in acceptance and commitment therapy practice being able to tolerate the uncomfortable by staying in the present despite the uncomfortable. Back to the gospel and the young man who faced a spiritual dilemma. Teacher, I've kept the commandments since my youth. And Jesus looked at him, wrapped him in grace and said, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the treasure to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrases so well. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear, and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. Yes, the young man wanted to know what was necessary for him to inherit eternal life. And Jesus eventually gets to the answer to that question. A key to treasure in heaven is following Jesus through the thick and thin now, letting go and letting God. We don't earn treasure in heaven. No, the treasure is a gift that Jesus gets to give each child of God who opens their hands to receive it. A relationship with Christ is to be received as the gracious and undeserved gift that it is. Jesus invites lots of people to come and follow, even when that means standing in line not knowing which way the line is moving or if it's even moving at all. We think that the line has an end or a destination or an entrance to get to, but Jesus sees the line as a circle where all are included in God's grace. The invitation to come and follow is rich indeed. And those who follow Jesus follow the Son of God who had no earthly house. He had no retirement account. No cherished possessions packed away. Possessions maybe even forgotten in a storage unit near your lake cabin or a place down south or both. Yes, now we're getting to that part of the sermon that needs some translation. The part where you and the God who sustains you have a heart-to-heart conversation as to how personal experiences of wealth and riches and, and grace intersect with our bank accounts and our generosity. It's amazing indeed when such conversations take place at the, easy, at the foot of the cross and how easy it is to receive grace and to let God. It's transforming indeed when those heart-to-heart conversations take place near Ash Wednesday, or maybe during the remaining Wednesdays of Lent as diverse peoples form a circle of believers. And we do that. We realize that 
we're not alone at the front of the line nor the end of the line, but simply within a huge circle of God's children of every tribe and race. As how our wealth and riches and grace received intersect with the lives of people of China, South Africa, Australia, well, that's still to be seen. How our wealth and riches and grace received intersect with the lives of the children of Haiti or here in St. Cloud or just down the block, it's still to be seen. Henry Nouwen once said, when we give ourselves to planting and nurturing love here on earth, our efforts will reach beyond our own chronological existence. Last week I told the story of Ronald Reed, that janitor from Vermont. Everybody thought he was a janitor, a lowly, humble man. But his financial gifts given to a hospital and a library following his death said quite the contrary. He gave away $6 million of his estate. Well, today I close with words Anna Lamott has once written. She says, gratitude begins in our hearts and then dovetails into our behavior. Grace almost always makes us willing to be of service, which is where the joy resides. And when we are aware of all that has been given to us for our receiving, it's hard to not be humbled and pleased to give back. We pray. Oh, yes, gracious God, help us to let go of those things that weigh us down so much that they prevent us from following you. Help us trust your promises that we are both cared for and blessed beyond our imagining. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.